Hey YouTube, welcome back. In today's video, we are going to briefly summarize the contributions of four men to the Christian monastic lifestyle. We are going to learn about Pacomius, Basil the Great, Martin of Tours, and Augustine, otherwise known as Saint Augustine. So before we get started, I want to take a moment to ask you to please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. I also, before we get started, want to mention that there are some very hard to pronounce names of people and places. I'm going to do the best I can to pronounce the names right, but there's a chance that I may be mispronouncing some of the names of people and places. I had the coolest dream. My dream was about a monk in Taiwan who had chickens, ran a bed and breakfast for Christians in need of shelter, and had church service whenever someone came through those doors 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The four-story building in my dream was typical of foreign architecture, where the building almost seemed to lean out towards the street with every level that was built out, that was built up on top of the next. I woke up at home in my bed with 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, just impressed upon my heart. And that verse reads, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. This was a holy dream that I had, but the dear brothers that we're about to learn about in this video really, really lived it. This is their story. So we're going to start with Pacomius. Pacomius, a soldier who had been born again named Pacomius, went home after being discharged and he lived his life as a hermit. There he waited upon the Lord, grew in his walk with Jesus Christ, and was called to start what is known as communal monasticism, or monasteries. Somewhere around the year 320 AD, Pacomius started a monastic community in Tabanissi, which was in Egypt close to the Nile River. Pacomius was against extremism, and like many Christians I know to this very day, he insisted on taking regular meals. Much of their community was based on worship, and they had a great work ethic, as they supported themselves with the fruits and vegetables that they grew, as well as weaving palm mats. If a person wanted to join the monastery, they had to hand over their personal wealth to the benefit of the whole community, and successfully pass a probation period to make sure that they were the real deal, and they really wanted to live this monastic lifestyle of self-reflection dedicated to studying the word of God. A tradition that they had was to make the prospective communal members stand outside the front door for several days. A big part of a person's acceptance into the community was to memorize whole sections of the Bible. If a person did not know how to read or write, the other monks would work with them in order to teach them the skills that they needed to spend their life immersed in God's word. At first, Pacomius started communities for men, but before Pacomius died, he also supervised the establishment of the first women's monastic communities. It seems that monasticism first came out of Eastern Christianity, but I also want to note that I hate pitting Eastern Christianity versus Western Christianity. So many scholars do that not realizing that God had a purpose and a calling for both Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity in the development of his church. God used a man named Pacomius who inspired Athanasius, who then brought notice to the monastic lifestyle to the Western Christians. From there, monasticism was endorsed, it spread, and it influenced many, including Augustine of Hippo, who we're about to learn about later in this very same video. So now let's talk about Basil the Great. Basil the Great. Basil was a God-gifted public speaker with good theological insight and understanding. 
Basil the Great, along with his brother Gregory of Nyssa and friend Gregory of Nazanasius, Nazanasius, Gregory of Nazanasius, have gone down in history as the Cappadocian Fathers. Basil the Great was born into a well-to-do Christian family in Caesarea, and somewhere around the year 330 AD, he had a top-notch education, but he turned away from the world in order to dedicate himself to the monastic lifestyle on his family's property. He was a dedicated Bible student. Basil the Great, along with Gregory of Nazianzus, put together an anthology of Origen's works, which helped to solidify Origen's place in history in Orthodox Christianity. In around the year 354 AD, Basil was ordained, and he went on to become the Bishop of Caesarea in 370 AD. He then started a monastery, which was smack dab in the middle of a hotel and a hospital that he started with his very own money. Talk about putting your money where your mouth is. He started a hospital in a hotel with his very own money. He had a great compassion for sick people and needy people. He wrote several books against the heresy of Arianism. And Arianism is the false teaching that teaches that Jesus is not divine, that Jesus isn't God. Well, we learned about that false teaching in our last video, so if you're interested in learning about the false teaching of Arianism, please go back and watch video number 82. Basil's writings on the monastic life had a great impact on Christianity, as no one had ever before made such a point to encourage love and community in the monastic lifestyle. Basil the Great truly taught in us instead of me, or a we instead of me attitude and mindset amongst Christians. One of Basil's writings was an awesome work entitled On the Holy Spirit, where he wrote about the Holy Spirit being God. Basil wrote many letters and commentaries on scripture, as well as detailed, detailed teachings on the Trinity. His teachings on the Trinity were so detailed that they paved the way for God's work at the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. Basil finished his work here on earth and went home to be with the Lord on the very first day of the year 379 AD. So now we are going to talk about Martin of Tours. Martin of Tours. Martin was one of the pioneer monks in Western Christianity. Martin lived the life of a hermit after serving in the military. He lived a, in a solitary cell. He lived in a solitary cell in France. Many people came to join him in sanctity, deep study of God's word, and a community was formed. Martin was nominated against his will to become the Bishop of Tours in the year 372 AD, where he lived as a hermit in a cell right next door to the church. He began to be distracted by people coming to visit constantly, and he decided to move to Marmoutier, Marmoutier, where he set up a monastery with a mission to evangelize rural France. Most of what we know about Martin is from a biography of him written by Sulpicius Severus. He is thought to be the first person who was considered a saint by the church who was not actually martyred or killed for his faith. Martin was considered a holy man, and his standard set the mark for many years to come as an example to others. Martin of Tours finished his work on earth and went home to be with the Lord in the year 397 AD. So now we are going to learn about Augustine of Hippo. Many of you probably know Augustine of Hippo as Saint Augustine. St. Augustine was born to African parents in the year 354 AD, though they actually lived in what is known today as Algeria. His mom taught him Christianity, and Augustine attended catechism from a very young age. Augustine's baptism, however, did not happen until the year 387 AD because the baptism got delayed by a re religious and philosophical pilgrimage. Augustine excelled greatly in literary scholarship, even though he greatly, greatly struggled with the Greek language. He was inspired into a love of divine wisdom by a work of Cicero. 
Augustine struggled greatly with Old Testament writings. Some of the stuff that happened in the Old Testament, Augustine struggled with greatly because he thought that they were barbaric. Confused, Augustine went to Rome where he ended up living a backslidden lifestyle. Bishop Ambrose influenced Augustine with Neoplatoism. With this lens of Neoplatoism, Augustine realized that God was perfect and he sought insight from inward contemplation or self-reflection. Augustine started to interpret the Old Testament writings as allegorical instead of literal, which I do not recommend. Augustine came to believe that evil was the absence of good and sought to abandon the flesh and the world. Augustine lived with his common-law wife for more than 10 years and was well on his way to high, offi high office. He was well on his way to high office within the church. Romans chapter 13 verses 13 and 14 spoke to Augustine's heart in a garden in Milan, which reads, Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Well, after Augustine's mom died, he returned to Africa to start a monastic community for study and contemplation of God's word, along with prayer. He was practically forced into the priesthood at Hippo by the year 396 AD. He had become the Catholic bishop. Augustine was a preacher, a pastor, giver of the sacraments, defender of Orthodox, Catholic orthodoxy. Um, he also goes down in history as the person who started to interpret the Bible as allegorical instead of literal, which again, I do not recommend. And he was very good at organizing charities, which is awesome. On top of all that, many of Augustine's writings are still an inspiration today. The City of God. Augustine's work, The City of God, showed his changing view from confident humanism into a more biblical view of the depravity of human nature. Donatists were those who frowned upon restoring Christians who had denied their faith during the persecution, and Christians who were half pagan and not walking the walk, helped to show Augustine the realities of the sin nature that we had. Augustine was starting to realize that some of people's flaws and sins were because of the fallen sin nature that we have. In his writing, The Trinity Against the Donatists, Augustine wrote of the church being a mixed field of wheat and tares. This means that believers and unbelievers are growing together until Jesus separates the wheat from the chaff, the real from the fake. Augustine also rightly pointed out that the person who was taking communion or getting baptized and where their heart was, is much more imp important than the person who was giving the sacraments or actually performing the baptism. You know, at that time, people actually worried that if they were baptized by a fake Christian, that it meant that the baptism wasn't valid. This mindset wrongly put the emphasis on leadership instead of Jesus Christ. Augustine has inspired Christians to this very day to endure this world where evil so obviously reigns, and to seek the peace and look forward to the heavenly city. Augustine went home to be with the Lord in the year 430 AD. God's work, in conclusion, God's word, God's work through these very imperfect people continues, including myself. There is a lot that we can learn from those who went before us in the faith, both from their successes and their failures. We must always remember that God's church is made up of people from all time periods and is not limited to those who are alive alongside us in our lifetime. Whether we are alive on earth or alive with Christ, God is the God of the living and not the dead. God is just, God is just as much the God of Abraham today as he is you are my God. Thank you for watching. Please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. Hope to see you in the next video.